This is EHJ Today uh, at the uh, Annual Congress of the American Heart Association 2013 in Dallas, Texas. And I'm talking to Dr. Barry Mercer from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So we're discussing the cholesterol guidelines. They just made the headlines, I hear, in New York Times. Why is this? I know. Only in the U.S. do we get our medical information first in our, yeah. our periodicals. Uh, I think because it's always big news, it's yes. big preventive therapy. Uh, and we have some controversy in the U.S., and controversy sells papers. Yes. So what, uh, what was the reason to... to uh published new guidelines on cholesterol? Was there any particular trial that made it necessary or was it just an update, a regular update? It was a regular update, although it took much longer than anticipated. It was a an update because it was required that the new guidelines be evidence-based. So in addition to cholesterol, we have lifestyle, we have obesity, we have hypertension. Guidelines have all been released uh, more or less concurrently that um, the goal was to be evidence-based, less expert consensus. And because there was so much new information, particularly in the area of lipid lowering. Yes. So what what are were the major discussion points uh, where was the uh, biggest change uh, compared to the previous guidelines? So the biggest change uh, probably that will impact uh, physicians is we are moving away from targeted levels and we are moving towards just a streamlined use of a moderate to potent uh, statin of a moderate to high intensity dose uh, without titration and without adding on secondary agents that uh, in clinical trials have had no additional benefit. So uh, you actually don't have to measure cholesterol any longer? Well, we do suggest cholesterol measurement for compliance. Yes. And also because a few patients will not achieve the desired 30 to 50 percent LDL reduction with a moderate to potent uh, statin, uh, and if that were true, then you might switch statins. So we're not saying that you should monitor, but uh, you monitor for those reasons. You do not need to titrate to a goal. But in many of these trials, the different dosages have been used, uh, for instance, in hypertension, lower dosages than in acute coronary syndromes. So is the actual clinical presentation of the patient also important? We do stratify four uh, patient groups. The most uh, in intensive uh, is the uh, established CHD group. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, lower is better, which means a uh, higher intensity statin. Uh, so the highest dose of one of the uh, potent statins uh, is the recommendation for that group. Uh, for the other groups, uh, pr practitioners can consider moderate doses of more moderate intensity statins. Uh, we calculate on our website number needed to benefit as well as number needed to harm. Uh, the increase in diabetes with the more potent statins uh, is very much in that calculation. So for these lower but still at-risk groups, practitioners can pick that moderate intensity. So stable coronary disease and acute coronary syndromes is, has not been separated in terms of... Not been separated, not been separated. and they all should uh, clinical trial evidence uh, suggest that the best benefit will be with a high intensity potent statin. And the, the lower intensity group, this would pa be patients with hypertension or, or who would uh, that be? We identify four groups uh, and uh, probably starting at the bottom, um, uh, primary prevention groups, if they have a 7.5% 10 year ASCVD risk, atherosclerotic cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. Um, these are new risk pools that are on our website, mm -hmm. and they are um, including now stroke of uh, coronary heart disease as well as stroke. So uh, the 7.5% is where these clinical trials demonstrate more benefit than harm. We are also treating um, patients with diabetes um, and, oh my goodness, I'm going to forget my fourth group. <laughs> I should have uh, prepared some notes. And it's all on our website. Yeah. And um, so going from the lowest risk to the highest risk, uh, you will use the very potent statins, high intensity, and then uh, going down. 
You mentioned diabetes, and uh, indeed uh, <coughs> diabetes is more common uh, with statins, yes. surprisingly. Yes, and yet all of the trials in diabetics, there is more benefit than harm. But should we monitor uh, diabetes more carefully if somebody takes a statin for prolonged periods of time? Uh, again, there are also diabetes guidelines, but in our guidelines, we do not suggest that that uh, needs to be done any differently than usual care, which is a yes. patient is diabetic, you're treating them anyway. Sure, sure, sure. What other uh, n n novel aspects are there in these guidelines? So we do um, expand the use of statins to uh, the primary prevention. Uh, we will, uh, in the U.S., uh, almost double the number of patients that would be eligible. Um, we reiterate that uh, for secondary prevention, approximately half of the patients in the U.S. are currently not taking a statin and that okay. this needs to be rectified. Right. And we are hoping that these simplified guidelines where uh, similar to how you might dispense an aspirin, right. uh, you give them the dose that they need and deserve. And that's uh, the most important thing. And that is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you mentioned other drugs uh, other than statins. Are they of any use? So what is the, the, the recommendation there? So for add-on therapy for patients that are tolerating a, a, a good dose of a statin, there is no additional benefit from mm -hmm. the multiple clinical trials. Um, we do have uh, in for patients that are intolerant of statins, and we know that that is a problem uh, for perhaps as many as 10 to 15 percent. Um, these drugs then uh, uh, come back, and we would consider using them. We would consider using drugs that have an evidence to support their use. Uh, so, for example, just as an example, uh, Coronary Drug Project did demonstrate that niacin uh, many, many years ago saved lives. So we suggest that if the patient is truly statin intolerant that you would choose one of these alternatives that actually had been demonstrated to save lives as opposed to some that haven't. Niacin is interesting because uh, <laughs> there was just a trial finished and presented at HPS the American... HPS Thrive. Yes. yes. Uh, so how do you reconcile that with the well, HPS Well, that was add-on therapy. Yes. So again, it was on a platform right. of statin therapy yes. that niacin added no additional benefit. So we're very clear in our guidelines, uh, uh, niacin as a, a, an additional. But as a substitute in a completely statin intolerant patient, we could consider that. Right. Of course, there are new medications hopefully coming uh, that for the statin intolerant patients, we will have some additional right. Uh, more uh, potent drugs. What about azetamide? So azetamide um, it falls into the category that has not yet demonstrated benefit to addition uh, in terms of uh, adding to a statin. And as a standalone, there are no clinical trials that suggest benefit. So the current guidelines do not uh, have a role for azetamide. Any other uh, new aspects? Um, probably other things to understand are that uh, these uh, these risk determinations are more precise using these uh, new uh, observational risk pools and then combined with the clinical trial evidence. So we are going to be uh, more specific about who really should benefit. And one of the um, uh, gaps that we face in the U.S. is that uh, we have health disparities where often ethnic minorities, non-Caucasians, um, have been the least likely to be treated despite often having the most risk. Uh, so for example, these expanded guidelines are much more specific and will treat more African American women. Um, we also suggest that women do benefit from primary prevention. Um, we identify subgroups and uh, show in the clinical trials that tests of heterogeneity suggest equal benefit in subgroups. Uh, and because we do not have 
specific trials. We do not have a specific African-American sure, trial. Yeah. We do not have a specific female trial. Uh, that for now, until we get new or additional evidence, the tests of heterogeneity suggest that we should be treating everyone that is at risk. So where can we read this? What's the homepage? Yes, yeah, so if you just go either to the American College of Cardiology Foundation or the American Heart Association, uh, just Google uh, new guidelines, it will pop up. And in addition to the executive summary, which is a fairly quick read, uh, the full text is simultaneously published in Jack and Circulation. And then if, again, you Google and go to that website, you can easily enter and calculate your own risk um, on this new ASCVT calculator. One of the uh, good things about this and a step uh, that we are taking is that in addition to getting a 10-year risk, you will get a lifetime risk. Okay. Assuming that nothing changes, uh, and what we will all see is, for those of us in our 50s and 60s, lifetime risk is very high. Yeah, that's that's the unfortunate thing. And that that is more yeah. to come. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. All right, my pleasure.